with a recap <coughs> about what we discussed. Let's say a recap that I found on a beautiful paper published a long time ago by Marcus Boff, that was one of the most important European seismologists. He was based in Uppsala, in Sweden, and he published in 81 a beautiful paper that was the story of magnitude. And in that story, I found this picture here. And you should recognize it, because it's what we found on Friday when we discussed the extended source. Why? Because, well, when we put back some information about the rupture time, as we have found in the Haskell model, that is the simplest extended source model, we have seen that we have two kinematic parameters that are very important. One is the time derivative of the slip, of the slip function, okay, and we call that the rise time. And that's one of the two boxcars that can be convolved to get the information about time. And the second one is rupture time. But for a simple unilateral rupture style, is the length of the fault divided the rupture velocity. But we found, at least I told you, that it is on average 80% of the S. So rupture time can be long. Now, when you do convolve the two boxcars, in time domain, in the displacement domain, what you are supposed to find is a trapezoid. Okay, if then we give a look to the source spectrum, what we found is something like that. Um, I've shown to you the reverse, but I'm sure that your fantasy will let you to switch it off, to, to make a, a symmetry axis here. What is important in this picture, and it will become important maybe tomorrow, uh, please do remember that the next lecture is tomorrow at the web, mm -hmm. yeah. because the calendar is uh, affected, positively affected by the, I don't remember the title of uh, those talks about string theory. It's not our string, it's in 11 dimensions or 26, but okay. So what we found is that we have a flat zone, and in principle here we can read, oh sorry, Oops. we can read a value that is connected with M0. And M0 is what we call seismic moment. It's the scalar part of a tensor, of a seismic tensor. Seismic moment tensor. Uh, this will become important, very important tomorrow, when hopefully we are going to discuss magnitude. What has to be noted? Well, here we have F1, F2, and they are related to the reciprocal of rise time and rupture time. And then, in a logarithmic scale, we have a fall off with the second power. So please keep this in mind because we are going to use it tomorrow, maybe. So what's next? Well, at the end of Friday's lecture, we started to think about instruments, but not from a very practical point of view, because this is the course of theoretical seismology, but from the point of view on how to record seismic signals. And I told you that the Richter, Charles Richter, that was the person who invented the concept of magnitude with a very simple formula, with a logarithm, with an amplitude, with a sort of a reference amplitude. Okay, he was using a specific instrument called Wood Anderson. Now, definitely I'm not an expert about seismic instruments, but Wood Anderson is one of the most prominent uh, elements or members of the huge set of inertial seismometers that have been developed since 18, well, let's say the, the, the end of the 19th century until the 60s. And all of them are based on a beautiful formula that you should remember. 
So let's start from here. And let's push the core cut. Okay. What do we have here is something that, he, that we know because we discussed it in the wave physics course. What we do have here, for example, is a, an oscillator, a linear oscillator. Could be a spring and a mass that is damped because every oscillator in nature is some way damped by friction with air or with some additional elements. Okay, and we know how this two parts affect the motion. Well, one is the restoring force. Could be Hooke's law, could be gravity. Okay, and that's it. And usually it's linear. If you believe in Robert Hooke, this is what you can write. Actually, this is called indicator equation in seismometry, but it's nothing else than the dynamics of a forced linear oscillator that we discussed in the wave physics course, just rearranged. So let's be a restoring force. Good. And we know that K is related to the spring. Or for a pendulum, it's related to gravity. Good. D is related to damping. And <clears throat> if we imagine that the fluid that is filling the dashboard there, we assume that it is a Newtonian fluid. It's not an inviscid fluid, otherwise no damping there. But we have a fluid whose constitutive law depends on the formation rate. Good. Good old news here. What is the only difference? Well, this one. Because now we have to imagine that the frame of a linear oscillator is on the ground and can be forced by the ground. Inertia will try to make the mass to stand while the frame is going to move. But the physics are the same of our old course. Just rearranged. Okay, what do we not sorry, what do we want to measure here is what? Let me go back to the lab. This is our lab. Okay, now what do we want to measure? Uh, I know it's a silly, very silly question. Let's imagine that, not an earthquake, but some vibration is making me to move. You see, it's working. What do we want to measure? Forget about me, please. But it's less like of what? It's like ground. Of a ground. That's our target. What do we measure? Uh, actually, we measure the differential motion of the inertial mass, whose center of mass will be, let's say, here, respect to the frame, because inertia will make it to step. So, just to say to you that what we actually get is this difference that is active here, but what we do want to measure is U. Okay? And that's the trick. That's the only trick that is representing the news oops, for today. So just to rearrange this equation here and using, since we are very smart, a new parameter, if you do remember, we discussed this sort of the recalling the, the variables here when we discussed the spring, the mass, and they are, how to say, embedded in a gravitational field long time ago. If you are smart enough to define a new reference state once that the spring is relaxed, and we start from that place, Okay, this is what we're going to do here. If you rearrange the equation, we get this. It's the same equation that we discussed a long time ago. Uh, just two things are different here. Two, usually, in seismometry, is left there. Why? 
in the way physics course, we embedded BAT2 into GAP. But by default, 2 here is left. But okay, we are not going to worry. M0 <coughs> for the spring and mass system is the same good old omega 0 of a long time ago. M is the mass and K is the spring constant. Okay? You do remember that K is not a wave number, right? What are the units of K? Thank you. Okay, so it's not a wave number. Um, so omega zero is the same, gamma is representing the same, and if you do remember at that time we embedded it into the Q definition. And we're going to use that Q definition uh, maybe on Friday. The other difference here is that we are uh, highlighting the forcing term because this is what we want. Usually G stands for gain because mechanically, with different tricks, we need an amplification of something. So mechanically or in modern times with electric electric circuits, we have a gain there. It's an amplification. If it is one, okay, game over. So, do you remember the wave physics? Old lecture? Hmm. Do you remember if we solved this equation? Are you sure? Well, we did something. Actually, we solved this equation when it was homogeneous. We did it. Yeah. And we discovered, for example, the effect of damping. But then we forced. But since I was lazy, I am lazy, the forcing term at that time <coughs> was a pure harmonic function. So I told, OK, let's imagine oscillation, forced but kicked. So what I can do with this system here, OK, for example, I can study initial conditions. I take it, just initial condition, and leave it. I can measure its natural period, OK? Or I can start with some initial velocity. This is initial displacement, zero velocity. I can zero initial displacement, some velocity but not forcing yet. When I was playing my silly game, making this, I'm forcing it with an harmonic, with a frequency. Actually, what we studied, what we've studied at the time was to consider something that was forcing the system with a given amplitude, with a given frequency, but not necessarily is omega zero. Could be much larger, could be much lower, could be near. And we studied at that time resonance because I can force it in this way. And as you notice, the system, the inertia of the system, is not letting it able to follow me. It's always out of phase. Or I can force it very at very long periods. And now it's okay, except some tilting. It's definitely able to follow me. Or I can force it near to its resonance. My initial amplitude here is very low, but the amplitude there is very large. So the system is able to absorb a lot of power. And we discovered resonance. OK. <clears throat> so we have considered as input at that time a frequency. Is it the Green's function? Now you should say, what is a Green's function? Wait a second. We do remember three lectures ago, we have used its definition, and then we solved it for a table or a room. Okay? Now, what is a Green's function? It's your time. It's related to the impulse response of the system, right? So 
when we do have linear differential operators, it's linear. It's a differential operator in just one variable. It's time. It's the answer of a system to the simplest input that we can imagine, a delta. Now, that should be a delta in time to have a green sponge. What is a delta? It's a kick. So, to have a Green's function, we should use not this one as a forcing, but this one. If you have that one, then the answer of a system is the Green's function, the impulse response. But we have not discussed that. We discussed this. Is there a relation between these two functions? Well, what is a delta? In one domain, when you transform it, it becomes constant. So in some way, in some way, there is a relation there because actually the other one is a delta in the frequency domain. Because when you force it with a given frequency, the spectrum of that function is a delta, but in the frequency domain. So we did, we, we have studied the Green's function. We have not called that the Green's function. We call that the resonance curve because actually we studied the delta in the frequency domain. There should be a relation between those two, at least in terms of describing this system here. Now, having told this, now we have <coughs> an inhomogeneous linear differential equation that we have solved. When it is homogeneous, we have solved. When we have a force that is a, not a delta, but a delta in frequency, we have solved. Now, what we want to do is to study u. Because that's the force, that's the acceleration of the ground. Okay? So it's the input to the system that actually we should get knowing this. Because this is what we measure, this is what we want to know. But it's simple. And actually, with some algebra, what you can get is the following. You can call it the transfer function, but it's nothing else than the Fourier transform of the impulse response. So when you take the Green's function, okay, the solution of the system where that is a delta, and you study its transform, you can call it the transfer function. What is that? It's nothing else than the ratio of the output and the input in the frequency domain. So please do remember I put it here later in the course. You have a system, you have a black box that is a linear system, okay? You have an X, you have a Y. You want to know Y given X. If you input a delta, what you get is the impulse response. And so you do know that you can write it like that. Convolution of the input with the impulse response. If you do this in the frequency domain, convolution becomes nothing else than a product. And this is the Fourier transform of the output, of the input, and this is called transfer function. So given that equation, you can write the ratio between the output and the input defining the transfer function. And there you go. It's very similar to what we did at the time of a wave physics course. But what we were plotting there at the time was power. It was the power absorbed by the system. And power is... Power is... Is the amount of energy per unit of time. What? Energy. Energy is related to the square of amplitude. So in some way it was related to the square of this function here. 
By the way, if you want to properly define the transfer function, there you go. Now, can we throw our friend on his wing on the moon? In principle, yes, if we have no damping. Remember, there is a 4 here because we have a 2 here. That's the only reason for this 4 to stand here. Now, let's imagine that we have no damping. If no damping, and if omega is omega zero, we have such a beautiful resonance that the system is going to explode. It's not. Why? Because we have some gamma here. But you can understand that the amount of power and so the amplitude that we get from the system will be larger when the frequency of the outer of the input is near to omega zero. Of course, that's our essence. So we can imagine that the largest amplitude in reaction to the external force will be near to omega zero. It will depend on g, and now we have omega squared because now this is displacement. Then we have also a phase factor. Now let, please do remember what, what I was doing before. If I'm moving very fast, very large frequencies, outer frequencies, the system cannot follow, and the phase will be pi. Okay, uh, pi over two, sorry, 90 degrees. If you want. So I'm here, the system is here, and vice versa. If I'm moving very slowly, so omega is going to zero, my omega, the system will follow, and it will be always in phase, and that will try to go to zero. And that's the end of it. Um, in the next page, there is the plot of these two functions. Let's now try to think first about this equation. And we will do something similar when we are going to discuss about viscoelasticity. And we will study with very, yeah, with very simple concepts and very simple systems viscoelastic circuits. Okay, now, that's the equation. Now, let's imagine that high frequencies are there. If high frequencies are there, the term x dot dot will dominate over this. Because please remember that every time that you insert, that you compute a derivative, omega is coming down. So very high frequencies, very large omega, so this term will dominate respect to this. And what you will, you will get here, you will get a strong acceleration in x. These two terms can be supposed to be negligible, and here you get u dot dot. What does it mean? But actually, when I'm forcing at very large frequencies, what I'm measuring there is x dot dot, u dot dot. Now, let's imagine to integrate. So this is proportional to the displacement of the ground. The displacement that I measure, that I measure will be proportional to the displacement because those two terms will dominate. Okay? But out of phase. On the other side, if I'm forcing it at very low frequencies, this term will dominate. And what I will measure actually it will be the acceleration of the ground, not the displacement. These are the two extremes. That's why, in other words, I put these two worthy things here. Very high frequencies. What does it mean? Omega is much larger than omega zero. Those two terms will dominate. And we are, if you want, here. And you see that the curve, the plot of the curve of the transfer function is going to be flat. Pi here will be minus pi. Uh, sorry, the phase will be minus pi. What does it mean? We are here. Okay? And what I'm going to measure, if I measure the relative motion of the mass, will be proportional to the displacement, to my displacement. Okay? That's the case. Then we will have a peak near to the omega zero. 
this is normalized to omega zero. And the height of the peak will depend on gamma, the Q, as we know. No gamma, well, actually, it will be a singularity. If there is no gamma, that is a singularity. But with gamma, OK, singularity is becoming something softer, more physical. And as you can see, smaller is gamma, larger is, is this peak here. On the other side, when the frequency is very low compared to omega 0, the system will follow. And the phase will try to go to 0. It's following. But the relative motion is much smaller. So it's moving, but it's moving pretty much in phase here. So the displacement that would be proportional to acceleration actually is very tiny. That's why it's falling here, because it's able to follow. So the delta is very small. Now, to sum up, that is the equation that we know, actually, we have just rearranged that is at the base of the dynamics of the first instruments. Actually, all the instruments until 1970. A revolution occurred at that time. But all the inertial instruments that have been used during the classical era of instrumental seismology are based with different beautiful mechanical tricks on this equation. Now, all the pictures that will follow will just show, as we have seen on Friday, ways to get these periods here, these frequencies here, in the domain of seismological signals. And at the time, the most important periods for seismological signals that are traveling around the world were between, let's say, 1 and 100 seconds. Now, if you want to measure 20 seconds with the mass and the spring, well, you're facing a problem here because omega zero should be low, so k should be very small, m should be very large, and you have a system that is not very stable. Or, from a different point of view, if you want to use a pendulum like that, to go to 20 seconds, you should use something that is 100 meters, like in the giant cave. But we cannot move the giant cave to make an instrumental recording around in the field. And the trick was to go to what can be called a static. A static is a strange name, a strange substantive coming from Latin, that means that actually, oh, well, First lecture in wave physics, we discuss potentials. Now, let's imagine that this is a curve, just one dimension, and that is the potential of the system. And we want to study equilibrium. You could say, well, that's a beautiful and nice, stable equilibrium. And it's this one. There it is. We are staying here. Now, I can do also that. Oops, you see, it's not easy. But as soon as I move, mm, it's not staying there. And we are there. If you want to be a static, it's a system that, in any time that I move it, is in equilibrium. Yes. A system that um, can be worked in a way but in each time, for each forcing, they are still in equilibrium. Do you want to see one? It's this. Uh, well, not. Now, yes. I move it, it's staying there. And when the curve is flat. Now, if it is always flat, you don't have just one period. You have many. That was the idea. And the idea was just to, I've shown it to you, this. Can you call it uh, 
Neutral in Italian is indifferent if you want, but so yes, that, that's the concept. Okay. If you put the system in that part, you don't have to care about the motion. If I move this just one more, it's not going, it cannot stay in equilibrium, so it's going to fall to, to look for a new equilibrium. Okay. So you can imagine to make the system here to stay in different positions. If you are here, okay, uh, you can imagine this like uh, valleys and peaks of potential. System will try to go to the equilibrium. Now, if you do remember, we studied this curve a long, long time ago. Let's see if I'm right. Let's see. here. Because if you write the potential of interatomic forces without going to string theory or to, to nuclear dynamics and you put together quantum forces and Coulombic forces, what you get here is this. And we have used that also for phonons. And we said, okay, that's a potential. It's an interatomic, is an example of an interatomic potential. You can call it a Leonard Jones potential. But what is important here is that we have a minimum. And if you have a minimum, and if you're lazy enough, you can write that minimum in, with using the Taylor's uh, summation formula. Since it is a potential, you can embed this value here, the minimum value inside the reference system, and the first derivative here will be zero. So the first term that will be active, it, it will be the second power, that's potential. And if you compute the force from this system here, the force will be a linear restoring force, Hooke's law. So we have used that, and then we went to a macroscopic scale to understand elasticity. So if you take a spring, in some way. It's behaving like a system that can be described by a harmonic potential. Harmonic potential means that it is parabolic. If it is parabolic, the force, it will be a restoring force, it will be linear. Hooke's law. Now, if you take that curve and you make it flat, you have a different system. Because in this case here, if I knock on the table, it's trying to go back to the equilibrium with vibrations. So it's going to move, but then it's trying to go back. It's a stable equilibrium. If I would go to something that is not stable, as soon as I knock it, it's going to be destroyed. If it is stable, well, actually you shouldn't hear any sound because it will stay, it is moving, if I move that, but just with, in this way, if I move it badly, it will fall. Now it's stable. Locally stable, but now if I move it in a proper way, <laughs> it's going to stay there without any motion. But if I move the pendulum, it's going to try to go back to the equilibrium, so vibrations. Now, if you have a stable equilibrium, it's very nice because you can measure time with your pendulum. You can play with the spring and mass systems, but then you have vibrations and you have a specific time. Which one? Well, f is equal to minus kx, it was written before. These were the first steps that we did in wave physics. Hooke's law, hmm. Newton. put them together, immediately you get this. And this means that you have a specific period. Okay? 
Once you give k, once you give m, that is given. So the idea was to make this restoring force going to zero so that I can measure whatever. That's the idea if you want to stay here. And that's why, usually, for those classical instruments, it was used the term astatic. Astatic means to use statics to go beyond statics and dynamics to stay here. What does it mean? OK, no restoring force. So the idea of the frame was to make it in a way that the mass would be always in equilibrium. because it's also a way to go towards something that is sensitive. Just to tell you that the first instruments were made with these mechanical tricks, so that they can oscillate gently at the periods that are of interest of seismology, and this means very long periods. So this very first part is letting us to understand the first seismic records, because all the initial systems were built in a way similar to this. That's the first seismometer. Now, why I'm, I'm, I'm discussing with you this in a theoretical seismology course? Because I want you to understand what is a Bud Anderson, because it was the instrument that was used by Richter, that was using it to define magnitude. But the second part of the lecture would be also about other things. OK, first seismogram, officially recorded. German instrument, Japanese earthquake. The second and very important one was Japanese-German instrument, but US earthquake, but San Francisco, 1906. So when Harry Fielding Wright was defining the elastic rebound theory, Bosch and Nomori were recording in Tokyo this instrument, this, this signal here. And if you notice here, here we have a sensor in modern terms, it is a mass. We have a frame, a mechanical frame. We have an input that you can imagine that is making the, the, the ground to oscillate, so the, the mass will try to use its inertia to stand while the frame is moving here. And we have to imagine a pen writing on paper on a drum. And the drum effect is here. And if you want, it's a dramatic effect. Because now the system was going, was given an amplitude there, but was not linear, because you cannot measure that one. So it's a beautiful sensor, but still the recording can be used better. That's why the next tricks was trying to move the drum out of the system. For example, using a ray of light and to put with a set of mirrors, don't, don't tell me any, any practicality there, to go towards photographic paper and then you will get a beautiful ray of light on a black, on a black background here. And, but before, yes, that's the Vickert. That's a huge one, uh, big mass. The idea was to make it stand there, to go a static there, and it was very sensitive. Uh, I've, I've seen it from, from here, I never opened it. So here will be some, some just few words about its function. But just to go here, because the English and American school developed the Bull Anders. And it was still based on a tilted frame but it was using torsion instead of a direct mechanical vibration there, so you have a wire that is, uh, that is torqued. And this one was using a ray of light. And this one was small enough to be produced, in a, let's say, to create a network. And it was the Caltech in California network that Richter had the opportunity to use. And since California was also a is very tectonic region, so with relatively high seismic activity, he had a lot of recordings to, to study. And that's why 
the next chapter of the story. We we'll start from this to, to see its idea, his idea. Very simple one. So this is the Wood Anderson torsion seismometer that was developed in the US and in California there were some of them. So the building of a seismic network. The fact the, that the corrections that Richter decided to use, I've shown it to you, it's not a spoiler, but uh, let's use log because that was Richter's idea was very simple. To equalize all the amplitudes measured by this instrument here to a sort of irreference value. One micrometer on a wood Anderson. For an earthquake at 100 kilometers. That's A equal to A0. That's one, and this is magnitude zero. He couldn't measure at that time negative magnitudes because this value of a zero was just a little bit above the noise level for this instrument in California. Then he was using some correction factors here to equalize for distance, for maybe different setting of the instrument, of a source, so some numbers here. Those numbers have been developed for California. That's why we will call that magnitude local magnitude, because the formula that he was writing was targeted for California. That's why, oh, well, okay, that's the definition of magnitude. Okay, it's a number. It was a sort of a revolution, because for the first time, one number was used to express, in some way, the energy released by an earthquake. Equalizing, trying to equalize all the other factors. It was an instrumental definition. So instrumental that nowadays it is called ML. L stands for local. But the idea was general, was universal, if you want. So, okay, that was the instrument that he was using. Now, I mean, the prototype of the instrument, of the instruments that they were using at Caltech in between the 1920 and the 19, 1940. Okay. Just to tell you that all these instruments here have a specific transfer function. You can tune the values, but the response curves will be very similar to the one that I've shown to you before. So with a peak at a given, around a specific period, and then going to 1 and then falling at omega square in this part. Uh, let's try now to imagine what is the most beautiful instrument that we can imagine. Well, the most beautiful instrument that we can imagine should be flat to all the frequencies. The transfer function it would be very nice to be 1 forever. From 0, uh, in terms of frequency or in periods, from 0 to infinity. If it is flat, we're done. Because if it is not flat, once we have the recording on an instrument, we should deconvolve the tap to have the ground motion. And deconvolution for a curve with a large peak is not as nice as just a division. OK? So that's the idea. Um, what are the other milestones in the development of seismic instruments. Well, there are, let's say, other two, at least other two. The first one is related not to this specific instrument that was developed in Russia around in the same age by Galitzin. Um, yeah, still, still you see a huge frame, a huge spring, a huge mass, but here there, there was something new. What was new here that the, actually in the frame, there was a magnet oscillating in an EM field. So the relative motion was causing a current. And if you have a current, you can take a wire, a piece of wire, and take it somewhere else. And this is nice, because now you can take the signal far from the sensor. So you don't have to stay there. With photographic paper, with, with drums, now you can take 
Your current that will be proportional to velocity in this case, it's Faraday normal plan, um, low, but you can take it somewhere else. And that's nice. So actually, after Galitzin, the principal design of a seismic instrument is this one. And you can call it electromagnetic sensors. Well, actually, the sensor is still a mass, but connected with the mass, there is a magnet. So the difference is this one. There is no mechanical revolution. Dynamics are still the same of indicator equation. Still the ground, the seismic input. Still a restoring force. Still frame here with a static configuration. A mass, some way hooks low, but the difference was this one. OK, and now we are ready to imagine what is the typical configuration of a seismic station, maybe belonging to a seismic network. Because the other revolution at that time was something that is appearing here first. But up to now, let's say until 1945, what we can draw there is a catalog of the response curves of the different instruments. And I try to put almost all of them. Okay? Boshomori, it was one of the first. Now, give a look, please, to periods here. Give always look to the axis. Here we have period. Before I've shown to you the transfer function frequency. So you have to reverse it. Okay? And you see that all of the, these beautiful instruments have peaks between 10 and 100 seconds. There are some that have a peak at shorter periods. But what I want to show to you here is this acronym here, WWSSM. Now, what is that acronym? Actually, it stands for the first, well, WW stands not for World War, but it was connected to World War, but worldwide. Uh, it was not exactly worldwide, and you see now why, but SS stands for Seismic Standard and Lab Network. That's a revolution. Not seismic, but standard and world, worldwide. What does it mean, standard? That all the recordings belonging to stations, belonging to that network, collecting those stations, they were producing, in principle, the same output for different input. So we have a standardized set of instruments. And so let's spend just a few slides about WWSSM. That's an old picture, and you see. But now you, you should understand why worldwide is not totally correct, because it was not totally a total war. Because World War was there, but not the real one, but the cold one. And so actually the seismic stations were deployed at the time, especially to study the nuclear power on the other side. So you see here that we have no WWSSM instruments. Actually, there was another worldwide, but it was the Russian one, USSR one, but it was here. But, okay, with terrible moments here, but the world was covered with seismic instruments. For terrible reasons, but actually, seismology got a sort of a bootstrap for the YouTube effect. The two things occurred there, okay, Cold War, in some way nothing occurred, but also computers, because in the 60s, it, you, you can see it was the starting era of modern computers. So the, there was the accumulation of a huge set of signals and the power to elaborate them. You should say, okay, hmm, hmm, okay, we will make those steps. But you can understand that this is the starting the gold era of instrumental seismology, the 60s. 
And if you give a look to the response curve of a standard WWSSM station, usually they add two triplets of instruments. Why triplets? Well, we have to record a vector. So three components. Okay? North, south, east, west, up and down. In the direct modeling of a, of a seismic signal, in the direct world, everything is beautiful. If you have a source here and a receiver here, if I want to compute the, my synthetic seismograms, I can say, oh, let's be radial, let's be transverse, and let's be vertical. So I can say, okay, Rayleigh and Lab. But in the real world, here, you cannot rotate your instruments for every source that is going to be, that is going to give to you some power, some seismic wave. So what you have to do here is to make maybe a north, south, east, west, and vertical. So if you want to be sure, pretty much, that your recording is belonging to Rayleigh, the only way is to use vertical you know that in principle of waves are just a sage. For the other two, you should try to rotate. So we got here two signals on here. And what you have to do next, ah, the source is here. Let's decompose these two and let's recompose really in love. But wait for a second. Remember that every time that you have an estimation, you have uncertainty. So maybe your source, you think that it is there, but actually it's there. So you're never totally sure that your rail is really in the real world, okay? Unless you use vertical, okay? Good. Just to let you to understand that the normal notation of a WWSSN network should contain a triplet of what? Well, what is called usually long period, LP, and short period. What is long, what is short, well, between 10 and 100 for long, and between 0, 1 and 1 for short. Ah, you cannot do better. You don't have one instrument that is flat. So you take two short period, uh, one short period triplet, one long period triplet. No other ways. Okay, but in some way it was standard. So when you collected uh, a signal from the Trieste station, it was there at the time, you can understand why, because the, the iron curtain actually was passing here because there was Yugoslavia at the time. So it was very important for the NATO countries to have these signals here. They were on the border in some way. So you take a signal in Trieste or one in Pasadena, they are carrying, they are, they are being recorded in principle by the same instruments. So same the convolution, and so in some way you have a worldwide standard. Now as I told you, it was not worldwide, but I had the I was lucky to visit Chisinau station that was in Moldavia. Nowadays it's called Moldavia. At the time, it was part of the USSR. So we visited the station in Chisina. You see two triplets, short period, long period. So the same was also on the other side of the iron curtain with different but similar response curves. So in some way, at those terrible times, the world was really covered by seismic stations. Okay, so in some way it was there. And when we open the box, you see that still the appearance of these instruments is the usual one. So a frame, a mass that is vibrating there, with a coil that is coming out and taking the signal abroad from the sensor. Then you can imagine to, to use computer, to use amplifiers, because it, now we have a curve. Okay, you can plot it. You should digitize it. That's the problem that we're going to study there. And that's, that's the next step. 
Because when Richter was using seismic signals, he had to use or traces on photographic paper or go with drums to look for pens writing there. Yes? Uh, here it says the magnification the slide for this one. This one? No, this one. The magnification. That means the gain? Uh, sorry, gain. Okay. Is it gain? Magnification is. Is it equivalent to gain? The y axis. The y axis of the flow. Oh, it's a relative. Uh, actually, you have to know. Okay, let me try to. I, okay, good question, but I don't care. Let me tell you why. Because one of the final pictures of this strange lecture, I don't know if we will arrive here, is going to show this. Oh, well, that's the end of the story. Okay. Now, give a look to this. Now, how to express the amplitude that you read there? You don't have an absolute, oh, okay, once you deconvolve the, the effort of the instrument, you should get centimeters, centimeters per second, centimeters per second squared, full stop. Or you can convert them in, in other units, but that's it. But before the convolution, actually, you have an amplitude that you don't know what it is. For example, it could be a voltage, right? Now, how to express all those units before the convolution for the instrument? In a sort of a relative way, like that. So what you measure there, if you want to take a standard, you compare, let's say, the minimum, and now we're going to discuss about that, and you compare to that minimum all the other amplitudes that you can get. The largest one is going to give to you the largest gain as possible respect to the standard one. If you take the logarithm, you will get something like that. Now, you can also do the opposite. Decide to use your reference amplitude to the maximum. So all the other amplitude will be lower. My answer is, at the end of the story, once you give a definition like that, your unit will be expressed in sort of decibel. So you take a standard, you make a ratio, you take the logarithm, you will get something between zero and your maximum, or from zero to your minimum. In that sense, that is, can be called magnification. In modern words, it's called dynamic range. And we will go to that definition just in the next, not this one, let's be end, but in the next, slide here. We have to discuss many things here. Wait, we will go fast. Have I answered? Yeah. Okay. So it's a relative yeah. measure to, relative to or a minimum or a maximum. Okay. The next step that was definitely another revolution was that now, well now, at that time, after the 70s, your information was digital. So it was not analogic. It was, you shouldn't go to, to a beautiful, romantic, but very difficult to handle drum of paper and look for, to the signals. Now you can digitize them and store in numbers. There are good and cons. The good is that, OK, you can start with floppy disk, then you can go to hard disk, then you, no, actually tapes, then you can go to hard disk, now you can go to flash pens. You can imagine nowadays the, the, the possibility to store numbers is infinite compared to the one that be in the 70s. But in some way you have numbers. If those numbers can be treated by a computer, and maybe you can apply a fast Fourier transform, 68, 72. And so you can give a look to a beautiful Fourier spectrum of a signal. That was a revolution before you have to use it with, with pencil and paper. So that was a revolution. So these are the good. What are the cons? Well, nowadays there are no more cons, actually. But at that time, 
there was a limit. Actually, nowadays we have to decimate numbers. So let's spend five minutes or less about this. Let's imagine to have a beautiful. Let me try to switch for a second. Switch the light on. Hello. Okay. Let's imagine to have a beautiful harmonic. Now, if we plot it in time domain, that's so boring that they should stay here forever. Okay? It's an harmonic. You remember harmonics? Yes. Okay. It could be 220, so it's the uh, or A, uh, forever. What is the Fourier transform of an harmonic? You have to answer in one second. You have to be impulsive. It's a deck. So the Fourier transform of that one is a deck. So in principle, it's the spectrum is nothing, something that mathematicians would kill us, but something that should be infinite and zero. Okay. Let's imagine to sample it. Now, let's imagine that I sample it in this way. Now you don't see that one. But you see these points. Okay? You could say, oh, come on, that's nice. It's still, you see an harmonic. Okay? What is the Fourier transform of the sampled harmonic? Hmm. Is it still a delta? No, it cannot be. Because actually, when we sample a signal, we are very lucky because now we can store numbers and play with them. But we are losing some part of the information. Because actually, also, if it is very boring, because we know this, it's not modern, come on, guys. Okay. Once we know this, in principle, we should store an infinite amount of numbers. It's continuous. Nature is continuous. It's not sampled, right? But okay, let's sample it. Okay, good. We can store it. The cons. What are we losing there? Okay. Now, what does it mean to sample a function? Well, it's like to multiply with a com function, right? So we take our f of t, the initial one, and we multiply by the comp function. Comp function with spacing of delta t. It's a set of deltas, right? Uh, I'm just using spending five minutes with, with your intuition, uh, don't think. So, what is the equivalent version? I appended to this part additional material if you need it, but you should have done it in other courses, I guess. No. Okay, it's very simple. Do you agree with me? A digitized function is the function multiplied by a comp function. I don't use comps, as you can imagine, but you can imagine what is a comp function, right? Okay. What is the Fourier transform of this? Now we do remember convolution theorem. Well, it should be. The Fourier transform of the function convolved with the Fourier transform of the comp. Now you can demonstrate the Fourier transform of a comp is a comp function, but of course with a stepping frequency of 1 over delta t. So what does that mean? that the spectrum 
could be not a delta, maybe something, uh, something like that, is now reproduced every one over delta t. These are not real. They are aliases. They are phantoms due to the fact that we have digitized our function. And you could say, okay, okay, we know, but we don't care. Let's cut them. Good. But you can cut them only if your sampling is small enough. Because if your sampling is too sparse, you don't see anymore, for example, the harmonic period. Let's imagine that I'm sampling every half period. Now, if I digitized these parts here, I don't see an harmonic, I see zero. So something is wrong here. Because actually, my samples are too sparse. I should take at least this. Actually, <coughs> if this spectrum is sampled with a sampling time that is too large, maybe they overlap. And if they do overlap, I don't see this. I see this. And that's a fake. That's aliasing. Those frequencies are not real. We see them, but they are not there. Actually, your sampling could be so large but you are putting frequencies here and they are not there. Now every time, maybe you are too young, but maybe you have seen some Western movies, old ones, and you see that the wheels of the chariots there, chariots there seem to go back. Or, okay, another, if you see a movie of a cathodic screen, not the LED screen, you see that it's blinking. Why? Because the electron, um, how to say that? Partial electron. Well, a cathodic screen is made by refreshing the screen at given rate. So that our eye is not seeing the blinking. But when you take a movie with a camera, with a classic camera, the frames that you're taking of that, like, like in the normal movies, are not spaced enough to make this as a continuous. And you see these blinks here. It's the same problem. You see frequencies that are not there. So, at that time, one had to be sure that the sampling was small enough in time to preserve the frequencies that are important in seismology. Now, this is called aliasing and the limit to separate aliases, because that's, let's imagine it's centered around F0 here, and this is reproduced after 1 over delta t. And there are many others. So they don't have to overlap. If they don't overlap, OK, we can filter them out. But that frequency, so this means between this and this, but the stem sampling step should be small enough. And it has to be 1 over 2 f max. So if you want to measure a given frequency, let's say 10 hertz, delta t should give to you at least 20, sample, 20 samples per second. Otherwise, oh, what's there? That's unhealthy. OK, that was one of the problems that was important time to get enough sampling. Another a similar problem, as far as I know, was to use GPS as seismic instruments. Because until the 80s and the 90s, the sampling was one per second. You can't see frequencies that are higher than that one. So for geodesy, they were beautiful, but not for seismology. Nowadays, they collect at least 20 samples per second. So now you can see this as you have seen also in the slides with them shown to you. So please do remember this. This is called Nyquist frequency. I say Nyquist because Nyquist was Swedish, so I don't know how to 
Rosa is Swedish, this is called aliasing. It's true for every signal. But it was one side of the coin. So, good, okay, we have numbers. Because, okay, we have to take care, because we have to digitize with a sampling step that is small enough, accordingly to the maximum frequency that we want to study. Higher the frequency is, smaller should be the sampling step, at least twice. Otherwise, you don't see the frequency. Um, as a final message, sampling in time domain is deciding resolution in the frequency domain. We don't have to be blurred. That's the maximum resolution that you can get. 1 over 2 delta t. Otherwise, they overlap. So, sampling here decides the resolution here. And it's also vice versa, of course. Let's put it this way. Delta T decides F max. Do you want to see the other side? Uh, not for this slide here, but another side. Okay. Let me continue with this naive version of things. Now, so putting your in your box the concept that every time that we digitize a signal, we have this problem. There is another problem in the real world. Now, let's take again our beautiful harmonic. And I've played it for you, if you remember in the wave physics. I was using the Fourier toolbox to let you hear, for example, 220. But then I was switching it on. And then I was switching it off. Because we don't have enough, uh, well, we don't have infinite time, right? So actually, we took of this one just section. What is the price that we are paying? So the good? Now the good what is, okay, we don't have to stay from minus infinite to plus infinite here to decide that that was an harmonic. The good. What is the cause? Well, are we sure that this is an harmonic and this is an harmonic? No, we can't be sure because we don't know, right? What is the price? Hmm. Well, to, to make this, it's like to take our f of t now. We don't multiply by a comb. We multiply by a box gun of a duration t, right? OK, convolution theorem. So what we are going now to see is our f of omega convolved the Fourier transform of the box car. Now you know. Because on the last lecture we discovered that the Fourier transform of the box car is a sync function. It is a sync function whose first lobes are 1 over 2t, 1 over 2t. is normalized or not. So actually, what we see now <coughs> is not a beautiful harmonic. It's not an harmonic. It's convolved by a sink. So we're losing a solution there. So the second complementary message is that Resolution in time domain was decided by maximum frequency, like this. Resolution in the frequency domain is decided by the maximum period. It's vice versa. So please do remember that every time that you don't listen to 120 
from minus infinite to plus infinite, well, you are blurring a little bit your delta. It's, a little bit, it's not a delta now, it has some width. And the width, the resolution, depends on the maximum time. Okay. These are the two complementary effects when we, you deal <laughs> with not ideal signals. There is the third side of a coin that is still related to digitization. It's the last one. And now, the last one is important. It's related to, let's call it, the dynamic range. Because now we have again our beautiful harmonic. We understood that we are blurring it a little bit. We've sampled it. But now, what about amplitude? Oh, wait a second, now we have to store those numbers on computers. So we have to digitize it also amplitudes. Okay, lazy people, just one bit. On, off. So when the amplitude is larger than something, it's one. When it is lower, it's zero. Mm. It's a strange signal. One, zero. You understand that the, that the maximum and minimum amplitude that you can record is limited. So let's increase the number of bits here. Okay? For example, we can decide to use here 2, 4, 8, 12, 16, 24 bits. What does it mean? That the ratio between the minimum number and the maximum number that we can store is increasing a lot. And if you express this ratio between the largest and the smallest, now, if you measure it in dB, you see that this is what is called nowadays dynamic range of an instrument. So, for example, with 8 bits, that was the standard for the early digital instruments, you see that the dB is, was 38. What does it mean? Okay, now please do remember the good old times of decibel definition. For acoustics, it was like that. I0 was a re the reference intensity. OK, 10 to the minus 12 watts over square meter. The maximum was around 1, so 120. But now, let's try to extend this concept here. A reference value, a maximum value, or what we can record here. Now we do remember that intensity is the power per unit of area. Power, power is related to energy over time. Energy is related to the square of the amplitude. So another vision, and if you, well, you should remember, in acoustics was this. To measure sound, not in terms of intensity, it is easy in some way to, to measure this. Our eardrum is working with intensity, but also with variations mm -hmm. of pressure around the reference value. Well, still some noise here. We have a reference value. Now let's expand this, and let's put the maximum and the minimum. And you get this definition here. Okay? With that definition, you can measure the dynamic range of an instrument. So that's why it's gain ranging that was your question before. So if you have just a few bits, let's say one byte here, you see that this was a little bit limited. And it was limiting the sensitivity of your measure. Nowadays, let me tell you that as far as I know, this is the mean. So now, the message for today is that we have a huge amount of numbers, both in terms of amplitudes, sensitivity, and also in terms of samplings here. So we can go to very large frequencies. Actually, it's so small, the delta t, that in many cases, for reasonable, uh, reasonable frequencies in seismology, 
Okay, typical seismology is working in terms of frequencies here until usually 10 hertz. Okay? The longest well could be 0 0.01 at least. One the seconds or thousands three modes. So it's a huge set. That's my problem. But 10 hertz, okay, actually the nowadays samplings are so tiny here the sampling time that we should decimate in the sense that let's get out one over ten samples here. So please do remember this. If this is your limit, it's enough to have 20 samples per second. If for some engineering applications here, we should go to 100 Hz. It's pretty much acoustics. So now you need a long, uh, a smaller sampling time. So please remember this. But in terms of sensitivity, the 24 bits or 48 nowadays are giving to us a huge dynamic range. That is in some way necessary. So this was the second part of the revolution. So worldwide and digital signals. So now let me switch back for this final 10 minutes, two slides only. Let me switch this off. And we can go towards the final revolutions, the final revolution, before giving a look to a nice picture that was describing a, a little bit outdated Irish project that was uh, to, to, to spread over US schools some simple, pretty much homemade instruments. Why I'm putting this picture here? Because that was something new with respect to the Galaxy 1. Amplifier, okay, you have a current there, so you have the wiring, you have the, mo uh, the wire, but something new is going from analog to digital. Now you have a tiny circuit in pretty much all the uh, electronic gadgets that we have in our pockets here. So we sample it, and now you can use a computer. That's the, was that the news? when you have digital numbers. The final revolution, but we will not have the time today for to develop this concept fully, uh, it occurred in the middle of the 70s. And it was so, the idea was very simple. In practice, I don't think it was that simple. Was that, okay, but still, now we have beautiful numbers, we have beautiful storage of records, but still we have to use, to use a huge set of instruments for short periods, long periods, where we have to take care about that they are standards and whatever. Can we have something that is broadband? I'm using broadband because actually it's the nickname that the modern instruments have, broadband. What does it mean? That we can cover from short to long with just one instrument. Now, can we do that? Well, now, just a couple of wordy slides here. Let me summarize them. Well, yes, if we are so smart that we are not, that we are making them active instruments instead of passive. What does it mean, passive? Well, passive is like a pendulum. It has its period, full stop. The length of a pendulum is given the period. The constant of a mass K and the mass was decided in the period of the, the mass and spring. It's given. So naturally, they manifest their personality in the response curve, in the transfer function. There is no way to avoid that. The idea was to go from passive to active. And that's the idea. Now, what do we see here? Well, we see actually something that is very complicated from an electronic point of view. Remember, we are in the 70s now. So, electronic circuits and gadgets were very common at the time. But the idea here use just, is to use just one additional feature, feedback. Um, 
and it is, as far as I know, something similar, similar to what occurred also, in, for example, for cars. The difference between a car with old suspensions and new active suspensions is just one. Well, the suspension of a traditional car has a spring, some way it has a spring. So when you hit a hole, it's going to oscillate with its Okay, but it can stay longer, okay? Well, an active one is changing its period according to the bumps. So, actually, how to make this activity to be active? Well, in some way, I have to know what's, what's forcing me. If I know, okay, then I can react. So active means that in some way the system, the black box that I was depicting there, is taking the signal out and back. So something is pushing me, okay, let's act in a way that I'm calling the pushing. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm stopping the pushing. So I am adapting myself to what's entering. It's active. That's why what is new here is this. A line back. Now, to put a line back has good and cons. What is good? Okay. Now, I have a mass, just silly words. Let's imagine that now I'm pushing this. Uh, there is no way it's going to act like, like before. But let's imagine that now he knows very rapidly that I'm forcing it with that frequency. And now it's changing its length to stem. With electronics, you can do that fast. Using currents, using circuit, it's fast. Okay? And that's why VLAND, many VLAND, and I put the link, we updated the link on these lectures, was able to build something. It was tiny. Why? Well, because the system was exactly as the other ones. So you have a train, you have a mass, but mass and K could be whatever, could be so tiny. Why? Because actually the natural period of a system is no more important because it's changing. How? With electronics. So if you have a feedback, the good is that you can change your time, your period. What is bad? But it's non-linear because every time that you have a feedback, you may have some non-linear effects. Now, before we start again with this concept, maybe on uh, well, tomorrow, let me just show this to you, and let's wait and think about this today. Now, the first part is the usual. We have a box, a black box, with a linear system, we have an input, we have an output. Usually, we characterize this system here with input response. And we do know that now, if we know H, that's it. Or, in the frequency domain, this is what I was writing before, it just the product. Good. Now we make, we add just one thing. We put something back. And let's imagine to put it back here, and then we are going to sum what we are putting back. Now the second box is something new. And it has a transfer function. Let's call it phi of 2. Now, if you sum it and you go back here, you can imagine that now you're creating a loop. So it can be dangerous. But if you're doing simple things here, actually, if you want to define the new transfer function of this system with this additional thing here, OK, well, what you have to take now is the ratio between this output here and the initial one. And now, since you added this, you have to take this. Now, the new one, uh, it was better. Uh, this loss, this should be capital. 
Well, it's in the Fourier transform. So now, if you take a minus here, the input now is minus 5y. And that is entering, and then it has to be multiplied by. Now, if you take this over x, that's the new transfer function. So you should say to me, so what? Come on, what should we do with this? Now, let's imagine that phi of 1 is the old transfer function of our beautiful seismometer indicator situation. We know the transfer function. So phi 1 is that one. What about phi 2? Well, let's make it simple. It's a constant. Okay, that's the result. The new transfer function of the two systems with phi2 as a feedback now is this one. And you should say, so what? Well, wait a second, now we have, God bless you, now we have a k. To put things simple, let's imagine that phi2 is going to zero. Well, phi 2 is going to 0 here, it's just phi 1. It's the old one, right? But now phi 2 is k. And now, this is a little bit different compared to this. Because now the peak of a curve will depend upon k. And if I am so fast to move k so that it's changing with the frequency that is perturbing me, now I can cover whatever, just playing with k. But they have to be fast. But thanks to k, now electrons are much faster than 10 Hz or 100 Hz uh, in, in terms of frequencies here. So actually, this new system with an additional feedback loop, very simple with k, now it has not omega 0. Now it has something that is changing with k. And if I'm fast to change k, OK, I can cover all the frequencies. But we will stop here for, for the reason that we have now reached maybe the last revolution. And we will restart from this line just tomorrow, since we have to wait just a short time. But think now that the final keywords have been added to inertial seismometers. Inertial seismometers, those ones, okay, K, M, whatever, they are passive. They are piece of um, genius work when they have been made, but there was one problem. The transfer function was picked somewhere. So when you add feedback, you can add some other Keywords, forced balance, feedback, broadband, whatever, uh, here I call them retroaction. What is the idea? But now the mass, omega zero, the real omega zero is no more important because I can change it with k. So I can make them also tiny, very tiny, this small. What is important is that I'm creating a feedback, feed, feedback system with, with proper electronic circuits, they are fast enough, uh, blah, 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 and so that I can change the frequency according to the frequency that is entering. Actually, what I'm doing now is no more measuring the mass that is moving. I'm measuring time by time the force, the time necessary for the mass to stand. And if the mass is no more moving, I'm done because I don't have to control the Dickert mass and to look at that. Whatever mass, I'm simply measuring what is the force necessary to make it stand in equilibrium. So in some way, it was a new version of the astatic principle. They are always in equilibrium. So I don't have to control this that is moving here. I can make some micro masses there and just measure the force necessary for them to stand. Measuring that force, I know the force that is acting. What is important is to be fast. So we, what we have added in these last two slides, and we will start from them tomorrow, is feedback, 
retroaction, force balance, and the result is broad bend. Okay? But for this last step, let's wait for tomorrow. You know that you three are supposed to attend the lectures of, I forget the name, I'm very sorry about that. They will be beautiful, they will be about the string theory, as far as I know, and they should start this afternoon in some way. At which hour do you remember? Four? Four thirty. Four thirty, okay. And on web, right? That's why we have more yeah. the, the lecture. Okay. So we will see just tomorrow, so wait for the final part of this lecture. It has been 24 hours. What I change in these slides compared to what you have there is the next slide. You see that. I did it. Ah, okay. Because one of the main actors of the last revolution was Herat Wieland, and I've seen that since now he's a retired professor, that the website that you have in this page here is no more there, so I updated it. Now it should be working as far. Okay. He was one of the creators of the uh, force feedback seismometers in the 80s. So, so be careful that the external link that you have on the inertia and strain, one of the first slides, is no more working. I updated it. But okay. So let me stop that. No, not that one.